Bill Gansky and uh, City Solicitor uh, Don Brody, who will also be out present this time. Uh, first order of business is to approve minutes for our last meeting of 2017. Do we have any amendments? Um, actually, I have a motion to report yes. on the floor, so I'll motion to approve. Yes. Seven. Any amendment? Molly? Um, it's not so much an amendment, but an addition. An addition? Um, so this is on page eight, and it is uh, related to the exchange around the underrepresented communities uh, at our last meeting that left me shaken and emotional, and what I imagine would be really challenging to capture. Yeah, I didn't really like that. So um, <clears throat> I tried to just sort of condense that um, a bit um, as an amendment to the, to the minutes and also um, just provide a, a statement maybe for this week's many meetings, minutes that can be included. Um, so uh, it's on page eight between the paragraphs that begins with uh, Patty Healy and Lynn Simmons. Molly stated that there is uh, an unhelpful shaming and judging element to Sam's language of disappointment and time wasted. Molly states that the purpose of this subcommittee was to consider how we can be more inclusive in our engagement and that the communication from a member of this committee since the conversations around this topic beginning in June have felt more targeted and negative and helpful and collaborative, both in private to Molly and in public meetings. Molly states that she did not sign up to be is that your amendment? That's the addition to okay. the last week. Is there a second? I'll second. Discussion? Well, so for the, and I can share this with you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the 10 1 meeting minutes, I just want to share that I would hope that in response to expectations around responsibility, this Committee would part attention to curiosity and constructive problem solving with the intent to build trust and collaboration rather than use this committee's platform to publicly reprimand, humiliate, and intimidate. I'm very disappointed, waste of time, this is a simple task, etc., which does more to undermine and harm and feels a lot like women. I'm not sure how this behavior furthers the strategic goals of the subcommittee and aspirations of the charter view to incorporate inclusion work. I initiated the conversation on equity. I organized two agendas and tried to corral discussion into meaningful the next steps. Limited as those efforts may have been, the conversation was started, documents can now be translated, and that may be all I can personally do. Others are certainly welcome to do more, and I'm heartened to hear that after I left the previous meeting, there was enough interest to take up the effort collectively because that remains an important one. My intent has always been to help with the support and commitment for making equity work a part of the charity process within the parameters of my own available volunteer time and resources, but perhaps most importantly, work with a group that may disagree with one another, values the informed, compassionate, connected, and skillful use of their power. I would appreciate if this group could be intentionally mindful of taking a collaborative rather than an accusatory approach going forward and bring our collective resources to bear. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Are you putting that in the minutes? Or yeah. Is that a request yes. for this meeting? Well, that's a statement that she made. She offered to explain why she is adding, she wanted to add to the last meeting's minutes. That's not something for the last meeting because it wasn't said at the last meeting. Further discussion? Okay, uh, let's vote on the amendment as proposed by Molly first. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Spot me, uh, I wasn't here. Was not, That's not here at the last meeting of state. Okay. Thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, any further amendments to the last Vote on minutes as amended. Vote in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstention. Okay. Thank you. Public comment. Fred, are you here to address us again? I can 
think I've said everything I can. Okay. I can answer questions if you have any questions. Thank you. Do you want to speak? Yes. Okay. So I'm Alex Jarrett, 8 High Street in Barnes. Um, and I'm very excited to be here. I've been meaning to come to this meeting for since, since the spring, and I'm really sorry I didn't get here sooner. But, uh, so some of these things are on the agenda, some you've talked about a while ago, but I hope that it's still welcome. Um, so election issues, um, I'm really pleased that you voted for ranked choice voting. Um, the, the many things that we can do to improve voter participation, so mailing ballots, no excuse voting, um, removing the candidate for re-election, um, so people you know, need to do the research rather than just say, okay, this person's the incumbent. Um, and supporting 16-year-old voting. Um, the um, aud auditing is one question that's on the agenda tonight. Um, I know that some councillors have talked about um, that we change the auditing company that we use periodically. I didn't see that in the language, um, but I wonder if that's something that's appropriate to put in there or not, or um, that's more just a policy that generally happens, just so that a particular company doesn't, um, you know, so that we get, we, you know, no one's, we make sure that, that no one's cutting corners by having different companies uh, do the auditing. Um, let's see, the outreach. Um, so I'm on the North Hampton Housing Partnership, and one of the things that we do we try to do each year is have our meetings at different public housing um, places such as you know we go to the community rooms at Florence Heights to Meadowbrook to Hampshire Heights Salvo House um, and we try to publicize uh, usually through contacts that we have in those communities um, to to let people know that you know to come talk to us uh, about housing issues um, so just, just putting that out there is sort of one example of a way to do outreach. It wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for this committee, but um, some way to, you know, and also recognizing that, you know, we're all volunteers and it's really hard to do that work. Um, so I'm a candidate for city council in Ward 5, and the one, so I've knocked on about 1,200 doors in Ward 5 so far, and that's a lot of work. Uh, we don't talk about the charter that much usually when talking with people, a little bit about elections, 16-year-olds, um, haven't really talked about that, but um, kind of, you know, what ways can, you know, especially since each of you are from a ward, um, or some of you are, you know, what ways can you engage that wards, uh, those, you know, go, go to some events or you know, something of that nature? Um, to try to, to get input sort of outside of just a, an announcement and come to this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, those are some thoughts on outreach. Um, thinking about the executive versus the legislative branch, um, thinking about the sort of checks on, on the executive power, um, and it's not a, I'm not you know, trying to comment on the current mayor at all, just thinking broadly about legislative versus executive. Um, sort of an example is the appointments, uh, confirmation confirmation of appointments that the city council does. And I've heard from some councilors that it really kind of feels like there isn't much room to say no. And you know, that, that, that you'd be spending a lot of political capital if you say um, no to a particular person. Um, and so just, just thinking about that, thinking about uh, should there be a way for the council to propose an appointment, sort of override the mayor in that, or is that, you know, is, 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 is it appropriate to have that separation? I don't feel like I have enough information, um, but uh, it's something that I'm interested in, in thinking about. Um, so, and then we, I know at last meeting there was talk about the information officer, om, ombudsperson, um, and thinking about getting new counselors and new committee members up to speed with information, making sure they're getting the information that they want. Um, and, you know, we talked about Lynn and, and your position and um, whether you, or whether the mayor's office has the, uh, 
the the time and to to really make have get the information to people that they need. Um, so, you know, it it would be interesting to me. I think good to have someone who's sort of outside of the mayor's office to to be thinking about getting that information uh, to people and developing a roadmap to getting new, not just city councilors, but new committee members. I know in the housing part, when I got into the housing partnership, it's just, there's so much to learn. And, and we actually are, we have now a manual that's, uh, that we've developed, which is here's what you need to know. And that's been extremely helpful. Um, so in favor of whatever we can do to get more information and get have those information requests be intended to uh, help them. Um, I think that's about it. All right. <coughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, you raised some very um, interesting points. I can see if any of the committee members want to uh, follow up with any questions. Uh, just to uh, be clear on the composition of the Charter Review Committee, uh, we are nine, seven of us were appointed from seven wards. Mm -hmm. Each ward is right. Um, uh, questions or reactions uh, from any committee members? It's a good summary of, yeah. of actually the meeting. So you sat and watched the video. So. <laughs> <laughs> the audio was. So uh -huh. it was small. Yeah, it's, it's not very easy to hear, but yeah. you can if you turn it up loud, you can it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. But no, so that's that, that's a fairly accurate summary. So something about having the meetings on campuses of uh, housing authority properties, I'm not sure we could check into that uh, because these are public meetings. Have to, the, the, from what I understand, I could be wrong. I think have to be held in the municipally managed property that's mm -hmm. accessible to all. Mm -hmm. And that is, those don't qualify. So for instance, we're going to go to Jackson Street School, which is proximate, you know, to Hampshire Heights and Meadowbrook, as as our JFK, but that's that's our workaround. It's not ideal. Yeah, yeah. It's not ideal because that makes me wonder if the housing partnership is not being legal. I don't <laughs> think I don't. It's a. I don't know. It's worth checking out. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think you got, if you're doing an informational meeting or information gathering, or if you're actually deliberating, it's a different issue. Yeah, yeah. As a public meeting, I don't know. And Unfortunately, the solicitor is uh, indisposed and won't, won't be here. He would be able to answer these questions for us. But, um, but beyond that, all, all excellent recommendations. So. Mm -hmm. The uh, question of the uh, audits uh, is on the agenda today. And in fact, we're, we're looking at a proposed recommendation to move the date of one slightly earlier in the year, I think we a three year contract rather than one year. We have not addressed, nor am I sure that it's appropriate for the charter to address the question of changing the auditor uh, from time to time. Uh, but I'll ask Bob, who has experience in this government and with an interest in this question, what you want to do. Um, there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained by having an auditor do a three year term. Um, it, it works a lot better for the city, and it works, it works a lot better for the auditors. The, the learning curve is fairly steep, um, and the demands on departments to, to in essence, educate the auditor can be steep. Um, and the uh, difficulty for an auditor to come in fresh every year um, is likewise even more challenging because you have to get the work papers from the prior auditor. There's a, there's a lot of orientation and uh, education that has to occur. Um, I've been through both scenarios and um, having a three-year three term is cheaper, it's more efficient, and the work product is better. Um, now, the, the requirement that you rebid is also very important in order that um, the council, who is the hiring agency of the auditor, and the auditor provides a report, 
to the council. So um, that that uh, requirement assures that there won't there it doesn't necessarily need to be a longevity relationship. However, it is reality in the field of municipal auditing that there are very few funds. So you tend to see the same players or subset of the players who reorganize and rename themselves come around every now and again. It's not uncommon to have an auditor for three years and then have you know, someone else who you worked for prior underbid them at the next audit. That's fine, you know, because that does present a fresh set of eyes um, and it does assure that, you know, um, abuses, abuses won't occur. But it was a strong recommendation to go with a three-year contract, mostly because it's a better arrangement for all parties. Um, you know, the audit's a, a very, a visible document, the management summary is a visible document. There's really, there's really very little um, that's withheld, and there's a wealth of information because the CAFR, which is a certified annual financial statement, which is your audit, presents budgetary information in a 10 year period. So you really get to do a lot of trend analysis, um, you know, looking at those documents. So it's an important relationship. It's, it's, it's vital that the council feel that it's in charge of the process. The report is made to them. Uh, the auditor has to present a, you know, a public presentation. It's important that there be an opportunity for questions to be asked and answered. Um, to me, it's one of the most important things that occur in the financial operation of the government annually. Um, it can be very frustrating when you do all this work and you make available the auditors um, in this presentation in one time. You know, so um, it's an important thing, and I, and I think handling it this way will benefit the city as well as whomever the auditor is. Yeah. Just to clarify, I, was, I wasn't speaking against the three year. I was thinking. You know, after that three years, uh, do we switch? But we it sounds like it. Like, like re -bid. Yeah, I think as a, both as a practical and a legal matter, it would not be uh, wise or probably possible for the charter to be uh, handed off to a new firm. But right. and, and in fact, actually, you don't want to compel. Well, first of all, here's part of the problem that Bob actually touched on, but I won't put it out that he did last time, or two bidders one. The current auditor and another agency, and we interviewed them and so on and so forth. But if we're mandated to change, and there's a reason we didn't choose the other auditor, a couple of good reasons, we would be compelled to actually choose them over the, the auditor that actually has has a deeper understanding of the community and focus on on on, on aspects of the budget that were most helpful to us. And so to embed in the charter a requirement or a mandate to change auditor, I, it's putting it out to bid is reasonable. And uh, and then when you have when you put it on an RFP more than two agencies respond, then not not a problem. When we only have two, that obviously means we if we embed that language and we have to choose the one who's less preferable. And that probably wouldn't be the best scenario. And also legally constrains by putting the charter legally constrains as Bob was pointing out the the will of the of the council. So that's that would be my concern, at least that, that kind of brand. Yeah. Um, Jim, I would be, Alex, um, we are having a community forum on October twenty ninth and among the groups that will be specifically invited are all the candidates on the ballot because uh, we, we will provide them with some material about our group at this point. We hope they'll come and comment and ask questions and be uh, part of the discussion. Um, but we want to do other outreach. So if you have any ideas about uh, other uh, ways of effective outreach to get some other voices to the table, um, please uh, pass along to me or anybody on the committee. 
Yes, um, Alex, I'm pleased that you were able to perceive in whatever review you've done of our work that on, on more than one occasion, in fact, quite a few occasions, the concept of legislative and executive authorities and the interaction therein was discussed. It's come up in a lot of different ways. Okay. Um, in, in, in most cases, we, we sort of felt that it's really not a germane topic to the chart. But it is a real germane topic to the administrative code. And it's particularly relevant when there's going to be such a significant turnover in council this, this coming year. So in the happy event that you happen to be elected, you will have an opportunity with a number of colleagues to visit with the executive branch, the mayor, as to how relationships between the executive and the legislative are going to occur. And so this is an opportunity for new ways of doing business to be explored, new ways of communicating, new ways of outreaching to constituents, new ways of answering questions. I mean, this is, this is really an exciting opportunity for, for the next council. We're, we're fortunate that some legacy members with a lot of intelligence <laughs> and, and insight and nationality <laughs> will be with you to help. Just <laughs> <I'm> the great <laughs> Uh, well, we miss you when you're not here, though. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that's really nice. Yeah, so um, this is this is a really an exciting time for me. And, um, and a lot of the things that we, you know, we struggle because we wish to get our, our work available to folks because a lot of important stuff has been talked about, you know, and hence the reason for having the meeting at the end of the month. Um, but, for the new council, um, you know, this is an opportunity. So, uh, to the points that you were talking about appointments, um, uh, the council actually can make appointments. We can create uh, appointment positions. Mm -hmm. um, we, I discussed that with Carolyn Oppenheim, spoke with us as well. It's different, they're obviously different. Um, but we cre we can create our own committees, ad hoc investigative committees, long-standing committees that also review for uh, the downtown business um, review that occurred three years ago uh, and the impacts. That was actually that was a council committee that was charged by the council president at the time. I think the board exactly like me, and then um, uh, and Council Donald who was, who was, who was co-chair at the time, and it was solely a council committee with citizen appointed representation. Um, and it does happen there's crossover. There are some we we used to the council used to actually appoint the auditor, appointed the tax collector, um, the, the, the police inspector. And that actually was problematic. Yeah, and the health director as well. Yes, exactly. And it, and it became problematic. Um, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which the council wasn't doing the research and, and the job review of, of job applications. First of all, someone applying for a position normally in, under the executive status can go in and be interviewed, be reviewed by a committee or a, 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 a point, which is frequently the case of department heads, in private. Anything that has to be done in the council has to be done in the public. There is no private conversation there. The public is allowed to participate, and um, sometimes that's good, sometimes not so good. It, it, there, there was a big ugly incident about relative, relating to the auditor back in the day when one citizen in the entire city took a scunner to her and started a really vicious campaign mm -hmm. against her, which is very awkward to navigate and negotiate, and there's no reason any applicant should have to be subjected to that <coughs> if you're offering the professional services or appointments. Mm -hmm. So that was back when the charter was a lot more sheer. It's, it's, not, it's not so much anymore. Um, as far as appointments and the concern of counselors who shared with you that they, they feel it's sort of a fait accompli. Um, I, I have known counselors to challenge certain uh, uh, applicants, and they have to make their case to the council as to why they think this person should not serve. The two times, two of the times I remember, both cases there were personal judgments. 
that didn't bear the weight of the special one. Okay, you don't like them politically, you don't like the way they conduct themselves, or they don't dress the way you prefer. But the fact remains is that they're qualified volunteers for the position, and they, the, the council voted to um, accept those candidates in most, every case, back in the challenge case. That but that's actually not a bad thing. But you remember, personally, first of all, most appointments, like all these, as you point out, are all volunteer. And, and you're, you're asking for the full spectrum of citizen participation. And anything that we do to, to discourage that because of some political thing or some other issue, or could be construed as political, um, we discourage people from stepping up because what we're asking them to do is sacrifice a lot of personal time, also to yell back, uh, also be subjected to criticism and, and commentary. Uh, it's, it's a special citizen who actually is willing to endure some of that in order to serve the community. And so there's a relatively high bar as we do the review of committee applicants, but for the most part, uh, I, I have never seen an egregious candidate come through that warranted um, thanks, but no thanks. And so, but Again, also embedding that in the charter might be a little more granular than, than it might be one, but I don't know. I don't, I mean, that's one thing. If it wasn't clear to me, I was you suggesting that in the case of an appointment that would be turned down by the council, could the council then turn around and nominate its own appointee for that position? Were you suggesting that that is something that that was I, I just put it forward as something to think about. I don't know if in any other city that does that. I don't know, you know what, where, yeah. Um, but as and again, it's you know it's not about this mayor, but it's sort of in general. What if? And I remember Bill Newman's column a few months ago that talked about well, what if you know things went really bad. And what path could you step in, could, you know, and try to fix things and, um, or would it just be kind of like the, the Supreme Court nominees where you just get one after the other that's terrible. And, you know, should there be a, whether it's like a two thirds vote or some structure for uh, being able to put forward one uh, of your own. Just, just putting the, that thought out this actually came up in the original charter discussion, charter review for the Davison Charter. It's come up here. And you know, the question of checks and balances to you know, to what extent does the council have the ability to check a rogue mayor? Um, which is why actually council terms are two years and one is four. So that if you find you if you have a toady council that's just being sick of pants for the mayor, you can fold the bums out. And replace it with people who would be more resistant to the mayoral agenda. We do have the means, we have two rather powerful means by which we can keep in check. Budget, which uh, that's a pretty big sledgehammer, it's not one that I mean, you have to use judiciously, really judiciously. And then <clears throat> the other is approval of appointments. And um, those, in theory, allow the council, the legislative branch, to. <clears throat> keep the mayor from going completely, oh, I don't know, you know, this bizarre scenario or like that we see playing out the federal government. <laughs> exactly. Um, you, so this is more basic and elemental than what we see in the federal government and more responsive, actually, ultimately. But and you're right, we always have to speak hypothetically, not about, we talk about the position of other persons who occupy those positions. We always talk about what's worst case scenario. How do we, what do we do given the worst case scenario? That comes up in many of the discussions about any, every these, all these issues of these things. And, um, and then sometimes we find ourselves we're going that we're just going to have to invest some aspect of trust. <laughs> there is a point which you can't 
anticipate every possible circumstance and some point you're going to have to anticipate you're just going to have to invest faith in the humans that occupy the city room itself. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, I guess. Thanks, Alex. We appreciate your interest, and I hope we'll also see you on October 29th. Great topic. Yeah, check my calendar to make sure. Got to yeah. the school. Well, you can knock on doors until 6 o'clock. <laughs> Fred, did you change your mind? I thought I saw your hand up. Yes, I did actually was going to ask a question, and you mentioned something about a 10 year budget. You called it a CAC or a CAP? A CAP. Yeah. It's what? CAFR. Certified Annual Financial Statements. And out of 10 years? That's the annual audit, which provides 10 years worth of information. Very good. Is that available on the website? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All of our audits are on the same website. Thank you. Do any community members have updates they want to share? Okay, I have one bit of research that I've done that I want to um, just mention to the, the idea that has been expressed a couple of times um, during the year of um, looking at uh, some kind of a, uh, a tiered uh, or sliding scale of stipends that you're able to go up and pick the city councilors. As a way of recognizing financial hardship and with one potential incentive to address the need for encouraging the diversity in this recovery. Something that interested me enough to, uh, I made some calls to the National League of Cities, uh, the uh, uh, to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and eventually I was led to a and that was in D.C. that I was not familiar with called the International City Management Association that does work with municipal finances. And um, I talked to a researcher there who had just coincidentally finished an analysis of data from 4,000 American U.S. cities. And uh, he said he wasn't aware of anything like that in the level of the council. I can't say that my, my uh, research was exhaustive, but I, I, I wasn't able to find a good model for that. I did, however, uh, because uh, Seattle is often on the West Coast on the cutting edge of interesting stuff. Uh, I, I, I called that to, uh, to Seattle and, and talked to uh, uh, the manager of the city clerk's office here. And, uh, she told me something very interesting. That Seattle's in the process of creating a, uh, a Green New Deal oversight board, which itself is interesting, but that's beyond our scope. But uh, among the provisions in that ordinance uh, establishing this oversight board is uh, if members will serve without pay, but those members who have a financial hardship can make a case to receive a compensation of $50 an hour. So that notion is at least recognized in that ordinance. Now, it hasn't actually been put in effect yet, so it's not clear how it's actually going to work and how the question of preserving privacy versus public records are going to be resolved. There's a lot of legal questions that I think need to be addressed with something like that. And I'm not bringing it forward here to say that we spend a lot of time sort of pondering this. I think it's the kind of thing that we may want to include in our report that, that bears further study. I just wanted to share that information. Bill? Thank you very much, by the way, for doing this. Um, on one hand, somewhat disconcerting that no one else is considering this. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, the fact that you were able to at least suss out at least the one, uh, well, at least you have here the uh, Post ordinance of the, the establishing the committee and the, the criteria of subsidizing um, members who were capable of improving and expressing need. I mean, one of the concerns that we were talking about when we, were, when we first floated this idea during the debate over site bends on the council floor 
when the Sharp Force came up, um, when there was an argument against providing site notice for the council, or at least or, or other benefits like insurance. And the concern that's been expressed here over and over again, this has been expressed in the community frequently, is that the representation is um, not diversified in almost every dimension other than uh, uh, sexual identity. Uh, we're almost we're exclusively white. That won't be the case after the election. Um, but the fact is that we are we have the means for the, for the most part, at least, to bluff our way to, to, to serve without end. And also, consequently, in a lot of cases, counselors have the time because of retirement stuff, which precludes, for instance, a single mother of two who is a Latina who has who would never consider running for council because that would be insane. Unless there was an opportunity to say the stipend, which is a gesture essentially, the stipends are essentially a gesture and thank you for your service type of job. But if there were an opportunity to uh, for the counselors to privately submit their their economic support system and that qualifying counselors could benefit could or candidates who eventually get elected would be able to get more money, perhaps enough money that would be uh, the equivalent of a living wage or more, mm -hmm. which would hopefully provide more incentive or at least eliminate some of the disincentive for, for serve. So it's it's it was a lofty notion. Um, I I can't. You're right. I don't think we can put it in the in the charter yet because first of all, there's no enabling state law that would allow something like this. But it is something that I think is worth investigating beyond this. Actually, I've been doing research on this for five years, and you found out in one night. One night, <laughs> five years. So. That's true. He's a was a reporter for a good portion of the century, so. Well, it's a large fraction of the century. And, and so I, I, I just say that, that I, I do hope that in our report, that I love the idea that our report would reflect uh, uh, to pursuing this in some way, not in the charter, it's too, too uh, unformed in order to qualify as a charter requirement. But the fact is, I think this really kind of speaks to a lot of the issues that come, that come up in the course of our conversations about yeah. fair and, and equitable distribution, particularly uh, class, across classes. So. Well, this is just purely sort of charter review committee um, what would we need, just incidentally, in order to be able to make it to a part of what would need to be formed? I think there would have that? to be state law state that would be established to allow you, one, the protection of private information, economic status information, so that in privacy. Right. As Stan said, that right now basically it's a public record. Mm -hmm. The other is enabling legislation that would say that communities would be allowed to do this due to compensate and provide stipends. There's stipend law, and this, there's no mention of this in stipends. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically across the board for everybody. Everyone gets the same amount, irrespective of mm -hmm. your status. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, made sense, I, I imagine, when you establish this, but the fact that in order for us to, to institute it, we need the state has to approve it. All things financial on the bigger issue, like if you're talking about local option taxes, things like how we're going to subsidize things and so on and so forth, we need to buy your leave from the state. And so I don't know, I know some people who have some connections with senators locally that might be able to impress upon them this might be something worth investigating and proposing and drafting something like that. But, you know, just for grins. Uh, um, just that I think it's a great option to consider, but um, 
really, I think, publicly funded elections have to be a part of it as well, because if you're running, you put in a tremendous amount of time with no guarantee of any compensation. That's not a bad idea either, of course. I also, you're probably aware, now that you're a candidate, that Northampton, uh, Massachusetts allows caps donations of $1,000. As far as I know, we're the only municipality to do so. Although uh, the cameras were flirting with something, they didn't want to come back. They didn't do it. They did talk about it, but we did it. And so were they, as far as I know. But in advance of the state allowing us to consider stipends, has there been consideration of accommodations that might be provided in order that people could serve who otherwise wouldn't, such as childcare? Transportation, daytime meetings. I mean, have you explored those kinds? Sign language, for example, that would fit in that same category. That's been discussed uh, recently um, um, uh, providing childcare not only for, for participants in the council, but also for right. people coming to the council meetings to allow the public to have an opportunity. Um, there's no funding line item for that. And, and also part of the problem is, is that uh, inconsistency. Um, but it's worth exploring and is being explored. I know Councilor Shero was talking about this. Uh, uh, candidate Minori was also talking about it. Other accommodations like transportation have been discussed, providing for the public, but we don't, I mean, short of the caravans and things like that are provided by the senior center or PVPA stuff, we don't have you know, vehicles. We don't have staff of the um, uh, of funding for that. But um, other than conforming to ADA requirements, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, we certainly spent a lot of time discussing what um, could be done to encourage greater participation. Um, it might be interesting to do some sort of survey or have have surveying done which would just what are the gatekeepers preventing people and if it is child care if it is transportation if it is eating meetings or whatever you know perhaps some of that stuff can be done without state authorization that's a great point yeah i could and is there a way we can be helpful in terms of the interview process to you recommend that or any would you recommend well that's a stance that you yeah. talk about embedding in the report i think it's an excellent idea is to, to say this is an aspect that was discussed one under the category of stipend and that uh you know invite further investigation see what that that sparks anything mm -hmm. uh -huh. it, it'd be great actually when i first floated the idea it's just sort of that was silence <laughs> and it was sort of like I mean, when you talk about something that new, somewhat radical, I understand. I just throw it off the top of my head. And I like the fact that we're still talking about it. That's encouraging. So, so, and as you all discovered, the food for government is at times glacial. But, unlike glaciers in real life, we're moving much slower. But the fact is, we are progressing. So, we are moving forward, and we are moving. So, I'll take that. Um, to Bob's point uh, about the study, I, I would, I would uh, urge both us and others, uh, the council and others who want to pick up this issue, to go back to the re-energizing democracy recommendation. This is a very valuable document, and I was personally surprised that I was not aware of it because I should have been in my work in Gazette. But it points out that uh, among the barriers, the three most common barriers to participation are a lack of knowledge of time, residents do not know how to participate, logistics, so residents do not speak English as their first language, the residents they require child care needs, 
the levy is paid for by subsidies for education. And thirdly, lack of trust or faith in the government. So there's some very valuable research that's already been done, and I, I would encourage that this document to um, be widely circulated in this And that's just have actually included a report. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, this will be a model of these appendices. Uh, you know, uh, just one last note on this topic. Uh, at the housing partnership, we've been working on the idea of working, partnering with a nonprofit to um, essentially fund, we fund, they would, we fundraise to get some, some money and then give uh, civic participation reimbursement grants with, uh, for transportation and child care. Um, so not this is it's separate from the city. It's just something that people who were volunteer members of boards could apply for. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we're thinking about that. Okay. Well, that's pretty It's not unheard of. We, we do we make adjustments and accommodations for things like that. But I think it's one more thing that just sort of speaks against it in some level. That, uh, I mean, the need for um, was originally discussed principally how the calendar gets squished and how the correct accommodations so that there's more time, I think, for the group of council to inform decisions and so on. But you no, know, that's on us. That's on the council. Was actually to do the research. There is enough time given the circumstances. There is enough time for that to uh, you know, the agenda. As I always said, if you need to get out at eight thirty, we go until two. <laughs> pretty, pretty much based on the agenda now comes up. So, you know, so having the conversation in June. Right. Just right. Yeah. They don't start to work until July one of the following year. Mm -hmm. How was the day of the Remember, I, I don't know. <laughs> I That part I don't, I, I'm not sure. I'm assuming that it was established when it was, the, the, the tricky part is always trying to do the backwards math and trying to figure out, you know, deadlines, clocks starting, State mandated requirements and time periods and things have to be decided. And this is why we came up with that issue about special elections. We never did the clock properly, and so we, that didn't work. In this case, I think I'm, 
based on faith, and hopefully the, the good people worked on it before, they came up with the state that's being the most practicable date based on all the criteria they have. But other than that, they just stuck a pin in a calendar. I don't know. But in your experience, has that date been any problem? Not that I've seen. I think initially when we when this new charter was adopted, it did just because yeah. everyone was trying to sort out what we needed to do, and there was a lot of new stuff. So I think that first year there was an issue, but I think since then a lot of it's been worked out. I think it was that first year that we also put out our RFP. Is that the was that the same year that we were uh, asking for bids for? Yeah, or well, right after that. There was right. one year that I think it may have actually. Been and then the next year, the next year, I think, was the RFP year, yeah. where there was a full, you had a full, extensive process. Right. Yes. So, if there's no problems with um, that question, that gave, um, so Can I just clarify? <coughs> the audit wasn't forgotten? I think it, that did happen. I think the it's just the keeping this deadline. That's right. Just so people don't think we didn't do it here. I'll be clear about that. I'll be clear about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then, uh, 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 your motion then to replace the current language. extensive discussion about September seventeenth and we decided that we let things settle uh, for a bit before we went back to it. I didn't set to bring this to the clear consensus. Uh, it is the issue of uh, whether the charter should specify uh, specific content of the content of format which they should be available. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll speak. Go ahead. Um, I accepted and do accept both uh, Fred's and, uh, and former counselor Moscow's um, notions and ideas, but the proposal, of course, wasn't particularly. The proposal's not well defined. It's and I've been thinking about this the whole time since that conversation. Is what is the best way to disseminate information? Mm -hmm. Particularly the voluminous information that we now have, as opposed to what we've had in the past, even in those books. And, and Fred, you commented on that. That's just raw data that's not analyzed or translated. One. And I, so I did some mild research, not deep research, because I wanted to approach it as if I were just just the average citizen trying to figure out how to navigate this. Police analysis, for instance. I mean, one of the things we brought up was murders. And the shocking fact that in 1928 or 25, 13 murders were committed in the city of Washington, which actually just blows me away. Mm -hmm. But, so I I just typed in the Google, some Google search, uh, Murders and violent crime in Northampton, Massachusetts. And automatically, this is, there's, a, there's a federal database that automatically distills all those and breaks it down according to type of crime trends over 10 years. The, uh, from Northampton in particular. Northampton in particular. It, it, it talks about the fact that Northampton, for instance, what, and this is what 
is actually embedded in Chief Casper's narrative in the budget book was that violent crime has increased, whereas property crime has increased, and that actually is shown in the same data process and data analysis. Um, and you can go, you can dive deeper in each one. And we have what's called open portal, which is the first in the state. Uh, I think it was first in the state, which is essentially every police transaction and, and contact and response is listed on there and described. Um, something that, um, unfortunately, everybody, well, I think some other communities have since adopted it, but since then, but by and large, we were one of the few, and we were the first. That stuff we couldn't put in a, well, first of all, put in the final term to be embedded in the charter which is the long-lasting constitutional document. Uh, that level of specificity and requirement would be, 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 be wouldn't make any sense because, as I said, this stuff changes. So the frustration, of course, is one, first of all, the notion that the public should have the optimal opportunity for full transparency and access to all public uh, information. Absolutely, I agree with that on every level. And, every, and anything we can do to continue to improve it, all the better. The problem is actually if you if we dictate one particular term that goes into the charter, for many people that's a stopping point. Okay, fine, we've met all that, right? We met that condition, and we don't have to start further. The, the thing about it that I'm particularly proud of this is, is that we push farther and farther as information becomes, and information processes and sharing processes become better developed, we employ them whenever we can. Now, to Maria's point, it's frustrating for someone who might not have the same facility I might have for, for research on a uh, computer. And I would say that Maria speaks for a large portion of the population. And I don't, and this is the part, this is the thing I'm trying to reconcile first. How do we make it so that works? for the community, to Alex's point that was brought up uh, about an informational officer. Uh, basically, we're talking about a facilitator, someone who actually can help someone guide, guide them to this information. That's uh, Dylan and others do that at the library. Um, Laura Crutzler, the counselor, the, 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 the assistant to the council, uh, also does that. Lynn does that, and he gets to do that. Uh, court does that as well. Um, when people call up with questions like, how do I find out uh, dog licensing information? You call the city clerk's office and the city clerk and Pam uh, We don't have one particular agent, but the fact is there are many points of contact where you can have people who will help in that. It's not ideal. And more importantly, though, it's also nothing that Everything I just described and discussed, we can't really, we can't condense it in a sentence that makes sense to be embedded in the charter. Well, I mean, I, 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 I came here sort of by accident because I felt I had an audience, somebody that would listen to me. I couldn't do it at the city council. I suppose I could talk to the mayor. The mayor would say, yeah, great idea. We'll think about it, blah, blah, blah. But at least I had a chance to take this 10-year or maybe 15-year idea and get it out into the open. I feel strongly that a lot of that information may be out there, uh, but it's not the taxpayer that has to do the research to go to Google and to do the searches on Google to find out how many murders were in town. I think the city has a responsibility to tell the taxpayer who's paying money what's going on in town. Were people born that died or vice versa? Uh, simple facts about the police, about the fire department, and uh, communicable diseases. I can go to the state and get the communicable diseases because the Department of Health sent it there. But should I have to do that, go to the Department of Health of, of the state to get find out what's happening here? I think for 100 years we had a very nice annual report, had specific information about communicable diseases, vaccinations, uh, the fires, where they occurred, what kind of fires, all sorts of information that assured the taxpayer and myself, for example, the city was doing its job. It really was. I remember reading the report from Police Chief Bernier. He cited 
for people for illegally walking on the railroad. Here's a guy who's really doing his job. What do I get from the police department? I can go to the computer and I can see the runs that the police are making, but that's it. What are they doing? Anything? I don't know. So basically, there's, there's a vacuum, and I don't think I or anybody else, Maria, or ordinary taxpayers should have to go to the web and start doing research when they're going to close Bridge Street schools. I was looking information on the schools, Bridge Street, which was established in 1743. I had to go to the state DOR local web page to find out how many students were there for the last five years and all the other students, all the other schools. It was a hell of a big job. If the yeah, annual reports were in the library, I could walk there and look it up in the library. One step, always there, hard copy. So I, I think something is necessary. Whether you guys can do it, don't know. Probably okay. not. Okay. Uh, are they doing it? You want to put forward a motion that we want to consider this point charter or we want to leave it to the administrative public? <coughs> how shall we resolve this? Robbie, you were not at last. I wasn't in, and I, I, I don't have anything to resolve it, but I do appreciate what Bill just said about, you know, if you stipulate in the charter what information has to be available, then you're setting a threshold that may change, may be too low. And, and then you can say you satisfied it. So I, I feel like it's another issue that, although it's tempting to insert it in the charter, um, it's not charter material, um, but it definitely, as the other things that we're discussing, to have great merit should be um, presented as something that we took seriously and um, exploring. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also, I feel like we need to, it's a sign of the times. You know, the basic information that's available has also changed, if that makes any sense. It's, you know, we're still living our lives, but there's more information available. And so, and so putting that information together in a way that can be presented to someone to sit down at a library table and look at, that's what we need to look at, at, at how that is going to be um, accumulated and presented. And, and, and it's, it's a wonderful idea. Um, we did it for 100 years. I, but but times have you know it, times have changed and I'm not and I'm, I'm not saying that to just say so we can't do that anymore but the availability of of information and, and the amount of information is so much greater that to do what you're asking would be um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to say it's the same thing but it's just it's not. Um, these aren't handwritten reports that are that are that are being you know compiled on someone's desk and then being you know put into a binder. This is information that's entered differently now and 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 processed differently. And I'm not sure what the best way to present that in a in a in a form for all audiences of all generations is. I guess that's what I'm what I'm saying. I don't have the answer to that, but I don't think it's Charter I think what you're saying, Rob, is that both the volume of information and the access, the nature yes. of access. And where do you draw the line? If you're going to get it all into a form for someone to sit down with, there's so much more information available that how do you decide exactly what you're going to make available? And if you insert it in the charter, then you're then you're then you're setting limits upon it. Which I don't think you want to go there either. Rob? I too have thought about this a lot. The city has an obligation to provide information. And that obligation is bounded by state statute in both respects. Okay? And you can certainly get the city to comply. I assume that for a fact. Yeah, if the city did not comply, lots of bad things would happen and certainly would not get us a AAA rating by the That's good. Okay. Um, so they have, a, they have a requirement to do this. 
I don't believe that the city also has an obligation to inform and educate. Okay? Now, there's going to, once again, there's going to be a bunch of new councils. One would hope that the city puts together a new council orientation session where a lot of this kind of stuff is discussed, particularly to address your, your colleague's comment about not feeling she had information she needed it upon which to make decisions. That's very concerning. There, there should be orientations as to where that information is available. Um, as Robbie suggested, and, and it's been said before, the reality in the new era is that people expect real-time decision making. When meaning that they want the information accessible to them at the time that they want to make decisions, which is usually right now. You, you're um, longing for an appreciation of a historical annual report um, probably doesn't comport with those needs. Because under the best of circumstances, an annual report isn't going to be done until like six months after the end of the year, right? So it, in, in some respects, it's not going to be a very useful document in order get real-time answers to police, fire, education, in some, in, in, some, in some circumstances. Okay, it's going to be dated, and it may not even be it's no longer accurate with regard to enrollments and other things. Okay, so between the requirement of the city to put out information and the obligation that I, that I feel that it has to educate people, I, you know, where I came from, the police department ran community policing meetings where they educated people about a lot of things. The fire department that I was a part of, we did a similar thing too. You know, again, it can be kind of frustrating when people don't come, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So having said all that, I'll make an, I'll make an offer to you that's something that I can do for you. If we can get our hands on the most recent CAFR document, which is the last audit, we can get it in hard copy. I would agree to sit down with you and go page by page through it, because it's a fairly thick document. I would be interested in reading that, but I'm not concerned about me, because, well, I'm getting older, I won't be around that much longer, but I think the taxpayer really needs this information, and he got it for 100 years. And you can say that you want to make real-time decisions and you need real-time information, but with the past information, you've got a trend. You can see whether there's a trend coming whether there's something happening. It also tells you whether the police department is doing its job. Now, if you go to the web, you can see that calls running down the police page. I haven't looked for probably six months, but they have police calls and a fire calls running down the page. They're going someplace, but that tells you nothing. It doesn't tell you whether there's more domestic disturbances or fires or whatever. It's, it's nice to see it going, it's working. But it doesn't tell you what they did. Did they arrest somebody? Uh, did they take somebody to jail? Did they give a citation? Did they, they pick up a warrant? Nothing's there. I still think you need an annual report, and there's something about it says something about the city. It's not 3,000 pages long with everything. You should have, for example, how many people were born, how many people died, how many people buried, maybe dog licenses. That basic information that shows you that the city is operating. It's functioning, it's going forward. It's an obligation I think you have to the taxpayer. Now, if you don't want to put it in the city charter, fine. I, I, I can understand that it would be difficult to do, it may be impossible, but it's something missing. And I've looked at those annual reports from, there's a stretch that are missing. There was nothing between 19, I don't know, 89 and 2000. There was nothing, nothing. And of course, nobody complained. Why? Because a lot of people aren't interested in government. But I looked at all the annual reports from 2000 forward to the present day, and the, they have a financial budget in there that tells you what's being spent. They also have reports from the various departments, but they're very, very thin. You know, I mean, they're nice, and they're addressed to the mayor. They're not addressed to me. They're telling the mayor, yeah, we had training for our officers. We had a new network put in to the system. But I mean, that tells me nothing about what's going on in the city. Zip. Well, I, that, on that point, I have already agreed with you. I looked at, I looked at the budget, 
and performance data is very thin. But you know, so I, I agree with you on that. Um, but again, you know, I'm particularly sensitive to, to this real time thing because when people were coming to my office, you know, they were talking about stuff that happened yesterday, right? right? Um, and the ability to access that kind of information, I mean, the the book in the in the in the record newspaper of the place where I came from, the the weekly police log was probably the most read piece of that newspaper. Yes. Right? You know, and that's where that information was. Um, so, you know, I don't know that we're that anyone's going to ever be able to respond to the entirety of, of what your needs are. But again, I think. That the answers are all there. Well, sure they are. Yeah. But I mean, my other point of view is that for a hundred years, with fountain pens, typewriters, carbon paper, they were able to produce this. Today, we have computers that are far more possible. We have word processors, we sell spreadsheets, self-publishing. It should be a snap to produce, reproduce, essentially those books with that sort of information. And well, the funny part of it is, Daphne's not here, but Forbes Library is continuing to produce the reports that they always did for the last 150 years. Right. Um, two points, actually, very well made. Mm -hmm. So far as that we have actually made an enormous leap since those uh, bump pen days when we were documenting those, and you're right. And also increasing with the facility by which we can process the data, the data has expanded exponentially. But we don't need all the data. We just well, need a basic look at the can, city to see how it's working. And, and honestly, that literally you can go to any number of websites and find out all the specific data that. that it's and, not a research project for the taxpayer. It should be done. We're paying for it. We want to see it. But for, and not to be argumentative, but for them to get a book. To go look at a book and look it up in a book would be the same aspect of research, just a different means by which you research it. Right? I mean, it, it is, it's a question of either typing it in a little window here or going to the library, accessing the book, and leaving through the book, going through the indexing the appendices and charting the same. I'm just saying the means have changed. We are in a point of flux where the, uh, the means by which we communicate, the means by which we access data and access information were a changing point. There are people who are you know, left behind or people who don't have access to computers, don't have access to the systems, but they're not as ubiquitous as people would hope. But the fact remains is that if we were to actually now catalog and digest all the information that we have it would that book wouldn't be this thick in a mock letter bound cover. It would it would be the from floor to ceiling. We don't need floor to ceiling. But that needs to decide. And that's another point. You have an example. I, I spent two months going to the library to get you a link so that you could look at one of those books as you was in and 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 actually and provide us with the books and it, the fact is that, that that's just one standard of criteria by which you would find helpful, but there would be other people in the community who are not finding helpful at all. You know what I'm saying? Would be as equally frustrated as you are. Um, trying to be all things to all people is also very challenging. I mean, I think the the philosophical thrust and the mission and the, and the and of providing data in a digestible and accessible form to the citizens is the objective. How that's realized is either in a small book or or a pamphlet or paragraph or it's being access to the internet uh, for deeper dives or more random looks. But that's where we come into a problem trying to say what are the things that we would require, right? Because as you said, by example, things that we did 150 years ago, embedding that in the council, please use the same criteria as was used in data analysis and data accumulation and reporting as was done in 1928. I don't, I, I, you can see the problems there. 
I, I don't see the problem. I, I don't, I, in fact, I don't agree with you entirely. Okay. I think you're. That's not. That's well, not that's, 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 I mean, if you want to say you can't put it in the charter, I can pull that. Well, credit. <coughs> Why my neighbor thinks he can cut down my tree, and, and it 
to buy a tree. So that's not something that we actually have in city records. It's actually the whole records that they can use. But they can send them to help them. So we're clearing house for information. But, and I think the one thing that we've said, and, and it was actually already mandated by state law about the annual report, and also the transparency also required sunshine laws, I mean, not sunshine laws, but the, the uh, open meeting laws and everything else all devoted to provide as much transparency. And this always speaks to the thing that I once said is you have transparency and then you have invisibility. They're not the same thing. And visibility actually, you can inundate people with transparency. And at that point, you have the paradox of choice. There's too much information. You cannot digest it. You can't possibly figure out what the hell this means in the context of Fred. I can speak to that. For the speaker, you have set instance, but it's frustration is that it's not as easily definable, as easily graspable as it, as it once was. Mm -hmm. I think that's clear. I think that's absolutely true. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Okay. And, and, but I don't know, <laughs> and this brings us back to the problem that Stan mentioned. What do you see in the charter? What do you see in the charter? Because in the charter, we're essentially mandating requirements of it. What do we say? Be better, be more informed, or provide better access for information. But yeah, I mean that's our mission. That's our goal. That's but at the same time, I also describe the problems, and I really don't know how you break it down. We can embed this in the report. The report that will show this debate and discussion. And I think that's that's helpful. Um, will be available to the public and searchable and so on and so forth. But the fact remains again that's the Fred point, it's only if you care to look. And that's and that's the and not a lot of citizens Fred is definitely one of them as I've said. Um, but Fred Fred stands among uh, a rather select elite few of people who are, who devote that much time and energy to doing that type of analysis. So I I, I as I said, I agree with the ethical Ambition. I just disagree with putting the chart because we don't. We're defining a cloud, literally and figuratively, a cloud or, or, or a figurative cloud. I don't. I don't know how you make that chart. Uh, no. um, make that charter language to. Can you just sort of finish that for me to do? I don't know how it how. What, well, first of all, we didn't figure out what we wanted to say or do, and because the thing about the charter is essentially is, is defining the rules and defining how the government will function. And if, if, if there were a glaring absence of information availability and, and that we were falling short of our required state mandates of, of providing that level of transparency, then that's a different issue. That's something important to stay when you start working with the general office. So then maybe the, there, maybe the argument that's being made is that there is a glaring sort of omission and that for a large population, at least one of them, this isn't, an access, this isn't accessible in its current format. And I totally agree with you um, that for many or some, you know, simply Googling could very well be a one-stop shop and a very successful and fine and efficient and preferred way to access information. But the fact remains that if there is this larger population that that just doesn't include, then does, I'm just wondering, you know, does our obligation to educate then, are we not meeting that obligation because that's simply a method that doesn't work for people? I, I wouldn't disagree, but the fact is, is I don't know how to phrase that language mm -hmm. because you're going to define the parameters, you can't define the response, the action, you can't remember. We can identify the failure, we can't identify the success. So the, the, um, by the way, this problem that's being described is not exclusive to here. Sure. This is universal. This is actually something that is a, almost a crisis of our time. The, the fact that uh, information and facts are easily manipulated. They're, they're, we are, our, our problem is we actually have too much information. We, can, we, we want to know how many eggs does a chicken average lay on average. You could pick up your phone and go dig it, dig it, dig it, boom, and bang. That's something you would have to ask someone once upon a time. And the, the, so universally, we, as I said, we're in this massive information shift. 
again, even speaking, even emphasizing why we can't embed this in the charter because we, we can't define it. We can't, we can't limit it. We certainly don't want to limit it. What we want to do is increase and improve access. And how do you maintain, how do you mandate access? Do we, do we say they should print a book annually? It does, it also, you know, there are people who would also be looking for access to the book and to read and so on and so forth. You know, they do print a the book. They've been printing a book between 1999 and the present day. There's a, there's a book that comes out from the city every year. Did you look at it? Well, the, which book are you talking about? The one that you shared with us? No, there is a... The, Oh, yeah, yeah. annual lottery. Oh, no, they're, yes, no, they agree. I agree. Okay, but in there are annual reports from the department. Head. Right. Not all of them, but some of them. And that's fine, but they're addressed to the mayor, okay. not the city. They're addressed Texas. to the council. Well, addressed to the council. Right. But I mean, all the details that these department heads are doing are not in there. I mean, it's very skimpy. And, and all you have to do is blow that document up, and you're back to where you were. The department, right, the department had reports in there are very skimpy yeah. compared to what we used to have back before 1988. Yeah, because a lot of the information is missing. Yeah. I think in terms of charter, in order to put this in the charter, we have to be too broad for it to be meaningful. So I don't think this belongs in the charter. If we, if we over prescribe it, we run into issues because this is a foundational document that's not going to be changed for many ten years. I I love info. I get what you're saying in terms of the charter. I just don't think it goes here in a meaningful way. There's so where do I put it? Well, we're we're trying to grapple with the question. So just to kind of pull some of this back in, there is something in the chart. It does tell you what has to be in the budget. It, it sounds like where the issue lies is that what the charter says and what the mayor Perry puts forward is, is not what Fred wants. And so the real question is, do we make a change to the charter that is specific to what one or two or three people may be seeking or is this general enough and Right. Well, 7-3. 7-3? Yeah. Seven, three. So okay. each, and just to add up here, each administration at, does the budget a little bit differently. And significant changes were seen as technology change. So what Mayor Ford did for a budget is substantially different than what Mayor Higgins did. And what Mayor Higgins did is substantially different than what Mayor Narcos does. And a lot of that is the people, the, the different touches everyone puts on it and technology. So uh, it's 7 3, section 7 3 spells out what needs to be included. And it's broad because I think it's what we're all struggling with right now. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll point out too is the annual report is calendar year, the budget is fiscal year. I have been trying to figure out why it stopped in 1989. I don't know. Um, but it's been uh, 30 years and we haven't had one. And I've been here 16, and I was not aware of an annual report until Fred Wright. And I've worked in multiple offices. Um, right. You know, you know, it may have been because of Proposition 2 and a half in the 18 month fiscal year that resulted in Proposition 2 and a half being active. And that, and that shifted, you know, the, the, the timing of the fiscal year. So that, I, I don't know for sure that that was a reason, but that's that is. All right, so in, in section 7 3, um, uh, uh, is there language that, that, uh, that applies to the departments and what the information that they are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says, uh, what is operating budget shall provide complete fiscal plan of all city funds and activities, which shall be in the form of the mayor deems desirable. Provided, however, that the budget for an official sub shall have another cost of compensation, 
and then it talks about school committee budget. Um, above that, it says, uh, it shall outline proposed fiscal policies of the city for the ensuing fiscal year, describe important features of the proposed operating budget, and include any major variations from the current operating budget, fiscal policy, policies, revenues, and expenditures, together with reasons for these changes. Okay, so what I heard is that um, uh, the Bob uh, verifies in his view the, the, the performance data and that and those messages from the department that is the standard. That would be the, the activity. Mm -hmm. The activity. Fred is asking that the budgets provide more activity information. Yes. So I am I am now totally comfortable that it is already in the charter and that we need to convey upon the mayor that there has been an expression of, of dissatisfaction with the completeness of the activity reporting in the end of the Okay, but I also believe that I've heard uh, that when the department heads testified before the city council, their, um, uh, they, they have, have more specificity in what they are, in the data that they're presenting. Absolutely. To the, and to the city council are, verbally. They're public hearings, so the public can also address questions in the department as well. But it's not, you know, to Fred's request doesn't really satisfy that um, because what the report on and actually from the working of the state requirements for annual reports and essentially all they're basically saying is it's a, it's a budget we present the budget. So yeah. the narrative that we provide isn't even mandated under, under uh, state law, but the narrative is provided um, actually conditionally in, in our charter. But again, it doesn't go, it doesn't describe in detail what items, how they must be itemized, how they must be broken down, what analysis it's at the mayor's discretion to feel that they are part of the best information they can for the city. I just uh, I want to offer one perspective that may or may not be useful at all. I hear Fred on some level just, and I don't mean to also suggest that what he is in fact putting forward is a relatively small endeavor. Like, there is a way in which to look at this thing. This is a you know relatively specific small request, and that sort of this idea that we can't assert that because it will potentially lead and culminate and have this sort of negative effect and set us up for the future to you know define things in very specific ways that may change over time um, is sort of the slippery slope argument. And I just want to make sure that the committee is aware of that. Um, and that we're not necessarily falling into the trap of that kind of rhetorical process where we could just actually satisfy quite enough, you know, quite a big number of people by making this accessible in this particular format. Maybe we don't define it, but maybe we say something to the effect of, you know, the city is um, committed to making information accessible, um, you know, and, and that's, that's to, to the most amount of people, but this is this is what mostly we're hearing though is this very specific request to do that, and I'm just saying, are we going to throw a relatively this you know this assertion out because we're so afraid that it might turn into this you know way more complicated thing, and that it just sounds to me like the possibility of a slippery slope argument, and I just I'm just putting it out there. We can totally disagree with me. Well, um, um, I think yeah. Well, uh, but it, it's just the slippery slope. I mean, insofar as that, you know, any document that's created, like sort of what we've read, described, digested down, it's like a film. Um, you don't see the director's hand, but the director definitely makes editorial decisions. Yes. Like so the fact is, is that um, what Fred requests, what Fred wants, is the particular data sets that he wants, excludes other ones that may yeah. actually involve. And as far as the amount of people we know who are demanding this or require this, we don't actually know that. <laughs> we don't know that. I mean, we do know we do know that in for uh, hopefully a significant portion of the population is a desire to get get information. Um, the 
the concern is also you create a digested, a digest of organic uh, which basically uh, break down on how many, how many communicable diseases, how many how many kids are in the school, by the way, 266 students in Bridge School. Well, I'll look that up. And uh, the, the, uh, the, you, you're making selective choices based on certain criteria, and that's someone's criteria. And that could be the mayor, right? So the mayor might have a particular narrative that include or subtract the information that's needed. That's, I think, the argument he's making because of the, the budget does the same thing, that the mayor's making selective choices. This doesn't answer that problem. It's the risk of inherent bias. You're exactly. saying so the, there is problem. embedded the risk of inherent yeah. bias. And, and as I said, Fred's actually the rare exception in this community is someone that, that, that has a desire for this much information. I'd be more happy providing Fred with the opportunity and working with him as Bob kind of offered to try and, or having someone else help him with this information as opposed to as opposed to trying to figure out the best way for each individual in the community to access this information. That, that's a, that's a, and that could be a lot. Actually, what happened, I won't go into the full story, but I haven't done any politics for many, many, many years. Actually, since the Vietnamese War, I joined the War, War Three Neighborhood Association. So that's how I stuck my foot into the part of it. <laughs> so I've been looking at local politics and talking about some political issues. I'm shocked at how little interest there is out there, and flabbergasted at the lack of curiosity and how government works. Well, really, you're the really. Kind of guy I always wanted to come to my meetings. <laughs> you know, I was crying because people like you would not come to me. But I mean, the point is, I'm not here because I want the information. I think the government has a responsibility to provide information to the taxpayer. I'm, I'm going to be 80 years old next year. I won't even be here to see what you guys do, probably. You so know, it's from a taxpayer, that. not me. Fred, did you go to any of the mayor's budget presentations? I didn't. I didn't. I went to the last one, but I, and I really didn't appreciate it. I went to two out of three of them, and I thought they were superior. His performance is excellent. Excellent. I've never. I mean, his, his discussion, his clarity. Blah blah blah. It is absolutely perfect. No question about it. But he didn't cover topics that I thought would be very important. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So I, 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 we're not here to do uh, the mayor's budget presentation. I do want to come back to the charts. Hopefully, pointed out there is some language that might be useful. Would you agree that the best one-stop shop right now for this kind of information is the budget? Correct. Mm -hmm. Starting point. Uh, is it possible then to add something uh, that would require that the final budget document would be approved by the include the supporting documents that were originally submitted by the department as well as the as their verbal uh, written copy of their verbal uh, presentation for us to, to require that the final version of the budget is published uh, include not only the supporting documents that, that were originally submitted by the department heads, but also a written transcript of whatever verbal testimony they gave during the city council month on period. In one document? Yes. In the budget. That's, that's significant because we, we actually, that all of it's public record and it is accessible by the council, we're just giving documents, supporting documents, but the testimonies, uh, video and audio recorded, and, and um, now kept by the uh, the media, television, it used to be kept at the line, the VHS um, So the whole breadth of their conversation is, is recorded. There isn't a transcript of it, so far as other than the the supporting documents are again the bureau pumping all the you can request a copy of all the public documents associated with it and, and, and 
it, it's uh, it's nothing like what Fred's describing. Right? It's nothing like that. It would be much bigger. Yeah. In addition, not every dependent present. So I don't think that's satisfying. It's, it's the biggest department. That I understand, but at least it would be a record of what what was said at the public hearing that is supplemental to the described as rather thin um, performance data that goes to the mayor when the budgets are, are submitted. Yeah, I mean, we, as I said, those are all accessible public documents as it stands. So I, I don't know where what we would modify by saying that must all be stapled together in one book at one place, right? I don't know. <laughs> well, and then really, how circular is something like that? Is it circular? Well, nothing um, on paper is circular. Right. That's, I guess, my point. Well, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying yeah. to find some so way yeah, of. Right. of I, I don't think we're going to be able to completely satisfy Fred, but we, there, I mean, this would be one way of putting in one place the, the both the, the original uh, documentation that comes in from the Department of Energy, as well as their, for those who do testify, their supporting testimony. It would be in one place. I just want to clarify, by circle, I meant piece of the space, not meaning that yeah. On each department that comes to testify, DPW, police, fire, school, on their websites, they all have all this information. Uh, one, the raw data and the data analysis, and, and then an open checkbook that is all costs associated with uh, transactions, salaries, um, domestic violence reports are filed. You don't get to know names, you don't get to know who. But you do do uh, arrest records, and then it's all digested annually, or it's broken down and describes trends over ten-year trends. And so, as I said, and in fact, this is stuff that wasn't available on. It. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's stuff that you wouldn't have had. It's just sort of like, yeah, so and so busted some kids walking on the railroad tracks. That's anecdotal. And we don't know if uh, it was they were arrested, kicked in the butt, sent home, if they were tortured or anything like that. <laughs> they were and cited. They, they, they were, were cited. cited. Yeah. Citation. So it, it, but the thing is that, that we have that stuff in even more detail because there's required oversight that doesn't exist. Then. There is required reporting and oversight. And so the thrust of our frustration, of course, is to one trying and meet your desire at the same time trying to figure out what's the best way to do that. And right now, because exponentially, there's so much more information that actually provides some of the analysis you're talking about. And who do we who do we appoint? Who is the one arbiter of that? Who is going to digest it, transmit it, and share it to the satisfaction of the fault of the populace? So. Okay, so I think we've heard a lot of different uh, perspectives um, on this point um, for the issue. Uh, I would like to hear a motion if anyone wants to uh, propose a motion that's related to this in any way that could range from something in charter to simply a recommendation. <coughs> I'm looking for any kind of motion because otherwise I, I, I think we've exhausted our, our I think the motion. Well, I was going to make a motion that we just include a letter uh, to the mayor and it's sort of good to share this with but uh, the, the concerns expressed here and, and, and the requests and as it says in the charter now it's up to the mayor's discretion on how best to, to meet those needs. 
Um, but just to say that, just to uh, transmit to the, to the mayor, to the council, that this conversation was had and it was concerned and it prompted much thoughtful debate at the same time presenting many frustrations in the Chinese city. And that's not a whole, I know, I'm sorry, that's not, that's, that's a, I'm just asking that as a request of you. I don't think it requires a vote. It's not a motion. I guess not specific enough, but I mean, I, I guess I, I know that it's not included in the charter and that we, we submit you know, by summary of our discussions about the issue and it's not included. And I, like I said, I'd read like 10 minutes. I'm just not sure that we can't include this in the charter. I totally have heard all of the arguments why and they're very compelling. Just right, thank so you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you guys. I very much liked Bill's idea to send a letter to the mayor and then behind that, I'm just not sure I would go so far as to say we can't put it in the charter. That would be not helpful at all. You're splitting the motion. Okay. So yeah. so we can separate out that portion of the motion. Okay. Um, and so the, the first motion would be to not include this in the charter, which we can take a vote, and I guess it's with one abstention. Yes. And the split out part would be the amended recommendation of supporting letter Charter may be needed. The letter to the mayor suggests that 
Yeah. Better criteria. No, no, I'm saying a, a better, a better way to present departmental activity data may be appropriate. You heard that not just in Fed, you heard that in other people. They are essentially asking for departmental activity data, which is in the chart. That's in the chart. He does a great job of presenting the budget. He does a great job in his, in his mayor's, um, mayor's budget presentation of financial planning information, revenue trends, challenges, opportunities. He does all of that. The one thing that I've heard from good other people is that acti departmental activity data is not available in a format that's easily acceptable to the population. I'd beg to differ on that. The council actually. Okay, take the council yeah, out. We've heard from we heard testimony that suggests that departmental activity information is not easily accessible. Okay. Is there a second to the box? Does this take the place of the second yeah. part of that? Of course. Yes. Okay. Is there a second part? Uh, second. Okay. For the discussion, it's clear that we want to send a letter to the mayor. I thought that's what we were doing. We were including, we were including some sort of statement somewhere, okay. whether it's a letter or it's part of the report or something. But to highlight this particular piece. Yes. Can you repeat what the third version was that I said they were included? Wait, not being included in the charter. Wait, not being included in the charter and, and what else? That's it. Race for well, that. Well, yes. That that original uh, motion that was split. Yeah. Um, my, I think the second half of the board is to send a letter to the mayor and the council. Drawing attention to our robust discussion, and but Bob has gone beyond that to say that there, there is here some believe is a better way, or should be a better way to present the problem. I think there might be a better So that is the current, that's the motion that we're saying. Okay. Uh, not to change. <laughs> Thank you for qualifying. Right? I'm sure you come to the awards ceremony because you're probably in line for you know, something. Okay. <laughs> but by the way, the reason the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association exists is in large part due to credit. And, mm -hmm. and I think you can ask for that too. But well, it actually it goes back to Bob Rechton. Yeah, Bob Rechton. Bob Rechton and uh, Jerry Butker and. Uh, I can't remember the other two people that were involved. Who's got it around AZ Science? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Finn. Yeah. Finn, Finn, and there were a few other people that started it. But it's the most effective neighborhood association. Mm -hmm. With more consistent regular meetings. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
only um, uh, in the discussion of the format by the report that we're moving forward. I believe um, Sam and I put our heads together. So Sam has done great work in keeping the people got up to date with all of the changes, large and small. I believe that we have now vetted uh, every uh, idea that has been brought to us uh, that we've raised. Uh, but I want to make sure that nobody feels left behind. Nobody feels that, that they heard something months ago that they wanted us to, you know, they want, they want us to do more consideration. Is there anything that, that we left out? Um, we will include the Google Doc, which will have 
all of the changes in Betty. Um, and uh, I think we may we may want to um, we may want to do something coding the, the sort of main changes so that they look up with what's in the in the executive summary. So that if somebody wanted to go from the executive summary to see specifically the language that we're closing on, whatever. Yeah. But I mean not just a a, a, a link, but but just to sort of refer them to the particular section of the of the chart. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. The easy way to do that would be an executive summary just refer to the section of the chart yeah. that you mm -hmm. yes. The executive summary does include the dates. Yes. So that if someone wants a deeper dive, they go to the minutes. Yes. Yes, exactly. So so it would be easy, I think, to follow from the executive summary to the to the Google Doc with the charter and the box that you can refer to the section of the, the charter um, uh, where the language has been that they changed or proposed. The minutes, uh, which um, uh, and have been extremely uh, helpful, mm -hmm. not only to us, but they will be helpful in the future as part of this day's work. And again, it's through your diligence that we have those to do. And then we... All our readers. For all our readers. This is very well read. It ain't going to work. Your children, the children. <laughs> oh my God. And then, and then, <laughs> yeah. and then the supporting material, the appendices, the, uh, the report, the empowering, the energizing democracy report, the various documents that we've gotten uh, submitted to us by email. The right choice photograph. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 All of that will be, will be part of the supporting material. Okay, so that's, that, that is how uh, we sort of see the uh, the report being being presented and put together, but but you know now's the time to speak up if you think there are other things or what whatever however you like. What, you know, what do you think about this? So I have a quick question, and speaking this has already been covered. Um, do we intend to present this formally as a council meeting? Is that something that would be? I don't know why, I don't know if I've had a dream or <laughs> we talked about this, but yeah, like um, there is, we did talk about that. standing up and, as a group and saying this is what we've come up with and you know, I, and I, I, I seem to recall in the beginning with the really big ticket items like a quick presentation item, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where that came from, but that's been in my head ever since, so I was wondering if that was something that... Well, we, we had talked at one point recently about um, making a presentation to the current city council um, at the end of the year, uh, although they won't be at that council, not the voting on the presentation or furthering our work. Um, and I, I mean, I, since this, that, that is the council that appointed us, I feel that would be appropriate um, for us to do as a, as a group, and then it would be up to the new council to, um, to schedule any further communications with them. Yeah, we need the, the new council to request a it's, it's clear that when, mm -hmm. when we submit the report to the city clerk, you're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're done. This is an added bonus. Mm -hmm. What do the kids say? Ghost. Yeah, she <laughs> goes. Yeah, but that yes. Is, a, yeah, I'm really impressed by that. <laughs> 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 not, 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 not we goes, but uh, like we've been goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that but yeah. in a healthy way. When Bob's way. rapping with the youngsters, yeah, like it's actually five. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so there's no. Um, I mean, you would not be compelled to come to the city council meeting and say in January. No longer, remember. but if you are, if you are so inclined, you certainly would be invited to. If we were invited, yeah. right. I get But we could, but we could, through December, we could go as a body to the currency council and make that. Make that 
before Bob officially drives off and his convertible into the sunset. Yes. We'll just pop that. Yes. Um, and, and you're saying, Robbie, that you think that would be uh, desirable? Yeah. How do you work out in the dream? It's fine. <laughs> I mean, Stan, if I may, I think the committee should do, you know, everything it, it sort of can to make, uh, otherwise what's the work? There was so much work that went into this and so much discussion that, you know, every opportunity to to talk with the current committee or if invited to the next committee to sort of see the follow through on this work? Well, yes, I, I, yeah. I agree. I mean, um, I, I too would like to make the presentation as, as a group to the city council before the end of this term. I think, uh, and just so you know, um, I give updates every time at every council meeting, we give an update about what we discussed, what has been decided just to keep the council prized. And then I think uh, get it added to the agenda would be just the ticket and to provide a presentation. We've had presentations on things far less important than this. And I think given the fact that this is an item that the council will have to vote on. Well, I can't predict what the new council will vote. Mm -hmm. I can predict what this council will vote. Uh, but I think it's appropriate for you to give a presentation. I'm not adverse to hearing it again. <laughs> in the new council, it was heard it here. Mm -hmm. I lived it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, so you all would give a presentation. I would sit there and you know, be part of the demonstration. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the difference is that we would be requesting, as a, as a body that is still in existence, to come to the council and make a presentation. After January 1st, then uh, Bill and the new council will will ask to will decide meeting. to take up the, the uh, charter. We'll ask to hear from some or all of us yeah. about our rationale. For One would hope, yes. Is there anything more that some the committee can do proactively to take me out about any of uh, agenda or the new council's agenda? Well, to be honest, I don't think it's a real big problem. I'm pretty yeah. sure that they would be. And given the fact I've come up with the agenda based on all the candidates that I've seen, that there's that there seem to be conscientious. So I don't if it's a problem, I simply all I have to do is request it. Okay. That's by our rules. I have to request it. The council president has to put it on the agenda. Yeah. So if it looks like everyone's falling short on that, then I will I will wield my mighty authority mm -hmm. to legacy grave your authority. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so we'll make that uh, request and uh, we'll come yeah. before the city council in December to make a presentation. It's a request that you as the chair should send the council or the uh, okay. Yeah. All right. It was the president. Okay. That would be it. Uh, right or not? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. No, I'm thinking about uh, oh, when? should we do that maybe the first meeting in December? Probably, yeah. yeah. Okay. December 5th? Pretty much that last meeting council is going to be like the last day of school. Yeah. Not a lot of effect in the film. Yes. Okay. So you December 5th, <laughs> uh, you I want to put that on your calendar? Mm -hmm. I'll make that request to uh, have the president have to eat here from us on December 5th. <laughs> Could be a okay. So in terms of the report, um, Three pieces of it exist. Dependencies, minutes, the annual annual I think everything's been sent to you, I think, that on that you've gotten emails on paper. So you should be able to put that together. I have them all together. Everything's okay. like the minutes we have their documents okay. are all together. Good. <coughs> so that minutes, the Google Doc, it's always been up to date, thanks to Sam. And uh, so just a question of the executive summary. If uh, uh, if anyone has any specific suggestions about what you've seen so far in that draft, please send them to me. Okay? Otherwise, um, I'm going to suggest uh, that, uh, that Sam, Bob, and I work together on 
putting together the final version of that executive search. If anybody else wants to be involved, please go. So um, we have uh, added uh, a meeting date in October because of the conflict uh, that Bob discovered. October 15th, an argument reserved by Ward 5 candidates for a candidate's day. October 22nd, uh, is a citywide candidate's day. Uh, so we um, set on October 29th as the date for our So the thought that crossed my mind that I haven't addressed yet is 
we will then need a translator at the meeting. Yes. yes. So we'll have to figure out um, if we can maybe work it up kind of a worker center if they can send someone um, or if they have connections to someone yeah. that can do it, even if there's an hourly yeah. charge. Yeah. 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 At least get an estimate on what that might cost. The only, actually, the only thing I would add to this is a brief explanation as to just what the hell the charter is. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it might, people might think it's time for fishing. Yeah. Very yeah. 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 People showing up. 6.30 at night. Yeah. We're going night fishing. It's yeah. dark. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've got 